There's a place where religion found me and I There's a place that I lose my selfish pride Fields of grace Hi, this is Ains of the Bar Center. You know me. <laughs> Pastor Jay has asked me to invite you all to join us to get real here at the Ecclesia Cafe Piano Bar. And uh, here is Pastor Jay. It's called Hypocritical Religiosity. Maybe a little bit like we did last time, but we're continuing on. This is number 31. The very ones who were chosen to establish the teaching and righteousness of God in this lost world had really blown it. <laughs> Hi! Welcome again to the Ecclesia Cafe in Calabar. This is the bartender Angel, and here's our favorite teacher. Are you ready? Here is Jay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Get Real, yeah. And thank you. Uh, Angel for that very nice uh, yes, intro. So, uh, Here's yeah. your coffee. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Angel, for my coffee. It's a personal sacrifice is what it's all about. We read in Exodus, Exodus 28, 1 through 43. I'm not going to go there. Exodus 28, 1, 43, and Leviticus 8, 1 through 36, all the laws about this, about the ordination of Aaron, the brother of Moses, which included his new garments. He was going to be the first priest. The pouring of oil and all that God had directed be done to give Aaron dignity and honor. This was necessary for God's plan in that dispensation, in that dispensation. To set him apart or consecrate, set him apart or consecrate his, him and his sons as God's first priesthood on earth. So did you know that? It's kind of important to me because I see this as the beginning of all the leadership of all of the different churches down through the generations even until now. For us today, this consecration takes place in our hearts through love of God, set, setting us apart. Our conscience is our guide to do God's will. We know what, what God would have us to do. We may not always feel like we want to do all we should for God. However, this too is God's purpose for us. We're to have this going on inside of us. We're to have this debate with ourselves and to choose. We have the right to choose. Yes, ladies. We have a right to choose and you have a right to choose too. What you want to do with your body. And if you're consecrated or set apart for God, then you'll do what God wants you to do. He puts stuff inside of us to be sacrificed. The things that we want to do, we said that sometimes we don't feel like we want to do them, but they're there. They're put inside of us, I believe anyway, so that we can see the difference and we can see what our flesh wants to do and, what, and compare that to what God wants us to do, then we can make that choice. And the fact that he can see when we are obedient to die to those certain things instead of living a lie or making an outward appearance uh, of some sort of, of a relationship with him for men to see so they can say, oh, look at him, he's really religious. <laughs> that means nothing, because he's reading our hearts. That is why we here now, for the sake of study, will replace this religious word consecration with that of which the cost really is for each of us. A daily, personal sacrifice. We read Jesus calling them basically hypocrites. The Pharisees were so hypocritical in showing in their religion that it was brought into all details of life, which could and would be seen by men. Their outside righteousness of religion 
manifested itself in outward appearance, ornaments, rituals, and anything the eye could see. Can we relate this to, to, to today? Our Christian bumper stickers? Our Christian jewelry? Including crosses and other symbols? Banners to put on the wall? <laughs> Earrings, necklaces? Supreme Puritan type dress code. Boy, you go to some churches and it's a parade. This looks like the Easter parade. The reverend's robe and shawls, and etc. I could just go on and on. I don't want to put it down, but these things mean a lot to some people, but are they really important? Is God really saying that all of this is wrong? If your conscience is clear about it, your inner conscience is clear about it, then it's not wrong for you. The problem most of us have with the outer show is that in this show, in the show, we tend to neglect the most important part of ministry. We neglect justice and to always be pointing to the love of God first. We're not showing love by doing this. We're putting ourselves above them. We neglect the justice. This we will read about next in the New Living Translation, Living in uh, Luke 11. I told you we're going to be in Luke 11, 1142. It says, But how terrible it will be for you Pharisees, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest part of your income. But you completely forget about justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes. But you should not leave undone the more important things than tithing. 43. How terrible it would be for you Pharisees, for how you love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the respectful greetings from everyone as you walk through the markets. 44. Yes, how terrible it will be for you, for you are like hidden graves in a field. They're hidden in a field. You can't see them. People walk over them without knowing the corruption they are stepping on. I like the New Living Translation is saying this. <clears throat> yes, on the outside we should tithe and be above reproach, but on the inside we should remember verse 41. It said, but give what is inside the dish and everything will be clean for you. Tombs were washed a month before Passover to warn all pe persons about becoming unclean. The Old Testament had a lot of stuff like that. In the Old Testament, in Numbers 19.16, it says, anyone out in the open who touches someone who has been killed with a sword or someone who has died a natural death or someone who touches a human bone or a grave will be unclean for seven days. Luke writes, you are like unmarked or hidden unwashed graves which men walk over without knowing it. When the customary washing of the flat tomb was neglected, its presence was easily concealed from view of passerbyers, and they could walk upon it and become defiled. Can we easily become defiled? With all the outward show of someone's religiosity, we are enticed and drawn in ready to accept anything they say. And if what we have accepted isn't pure truth, then we can become believers of something that wasn't necessary, or maybe not even of God. We are defiled until hopefully at another time through the Spirit of God cleansed by the truth through our faith and set free. Here we go with the homosexuals again. Some homosexuals and their families have had to go through the pain and shock treatment and programs like the ex-gay because of the religiosity of church tradition. Eh, don't turn me off yet. It was not of God for them. However, more damage may have been done. 
this is abuse of the worst kind, I think, and it wasn't necessary. If they had somehow maintained a strong personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, then they will be able to endure to still have hope in Him and His good news. To become the children of God, He had established from the beginning for them. But what about the youngest children? The Jesus said, let the children come to me. Don't stop them. The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Men seem to be more concerned about sexual orientation than Jesus was or does now. Jesus didn't come to condemn but to save us. And it's his job. Religiosity in our religion today is no different than it was in the time when Jesus rebuked them for it. It is mind-boggling that even today most churches in the United States lean on religiosity to sell their church and doctrines. The same religiosity of the Old Testament to draw and trap people into their churches with fear using an outward show of power and deception Miracles. When Jesus said that there were, would be no miracles except that of Jonah being in a whale for three days and three nights and he being in the heart of the earth for the same period of time and then raised to the right hand of the Father. And even though Jesus said this in scripture, our evangelical groups mainly try to stage outward shows of material and miraculous awe to draw crowds and develop mega-sized churches. Nothing wrong with mega-sized churches, but beware. And this, to control the Christian market. They want that market. They're fighting each other for the biggest market of Christians. Like a major corporation would control the market of their product. Apple. New Living Translation, Luke 11, 45. It says, Teacher, said an expert in religious law, you have insulted us too in what you just said. Six. Yes, said Jesus, how terrible it will be for you experts in religious law. For you crush people beneath impossible religious demands. And you, lift, you never lift a finger to help ease the burden you put on them. 47, how terrible it will be for you. For you build tombs for the very prophets your ancestors killed long ago. 48, murderers. You agree with your ancestors what, what they did was right. You would have done the same yourself, you said. 49, this is what God in his wisdom said about you. I will send prophets and apostles to them. And they will kill some and persecute the others. 50. And you of this generation will be held responsible for the murders of all God's prophets from the creation of the world. 51. From the murder of Abel to the murder of Zechariah, who was killed beneath the altar in the sanctuary. Yes, it will surely be charged against you. 52. How terrible it would be for you experts of religious law. Are you an expert of religious law? <laughs> For you hide the key to knowledge from the people. You don't enter the kingdom yourself and you prevent others from entering. I tell you folks, I believe that's happening today. Those who know so much about <coughs> religious law. What about God's law? What about the law Jesus told us to love one another? as brothers and love your neighbors as yourself and love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul strength and mind. These were the lawyers. They were different from the scribes and Pharisees in that they were a class of learned professors, teachers in the colleges, magistrates and judges. The weight that they crushed people beneath with impossible religious demands are the and innumerable precepts embodied in the Jewish Talmud, and we're still doing it. Precepts that the early Christians knew were not possible to keep. In Acts 15.10 we find, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks 
of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. And in Galatians 2.4, it says in the New Living Translation that some so-called Christians here, false ones really, came to spy on us and see our freedom in Christ Jesus. They wanted to force us like slaves to follow their Jewish regulations. Yes, Jesus called the Pharisees a bunch of hypocrites because on the outside they looked good, but on the inside they were full of wickedness. But it, it was the lawyers who should have known the truth, yet they were the ones who kept up the false teaching, still do today. God's plan for men to enter into God's kingdom was being hindered by these men. And it looks like the venomous teaching has trickled down even to the church we might attend today. Most righteous, born-again Christians today will say they are not religious. Religious. And therefore they are not hypocrites. Now, two more verses in Luke's chapter 11. NIV, Luke 11, 53, it says, When Jesus left there, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him something he might say. As soon as people find out that we are Christians, they are waiting and watching to catch us in something we might say or do, especially if you're a gay Christian. I say gay Christian. Now, in closing, we will begin another chapter in Luke, chapter 12, 1. In the New Living Translation, it says, Meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands were milling around about and crushing each other. Jesus turned first to his disciples and warned them, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware of their hypocrisy. Two, the time is coming when everything will be revealed. All that is secret will be made public. Three, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. When Jesus went to the cross, Jesus fulfilled the teaching of the Old Testament. He gave us a hope of eternal life with him and a new teaching and direction of how to get there. Now, in this teaching of the Gospels, we are seeing that new teaching unfolds, and he confronts those who are still committed to the traditions and regulations of the old, and who do not really believe in their hearts that he is indeed the promised Messiah, the high priest and king that had been promised. The problem was their unwillingness to look on the inside. Righteousness is not found in the flesh or whatever kind of outward show we present. Righteousness is found in the spirit and the soul of man. Salvation of a man and woman cannot be seen by any believer. So nobody can say he's born again, he's born again, no. Or he's not born again. Righteousness is found in the spirit. Because it's an inner work done by God, that's why. We then choose to be baptized in public, to announce to the world what has happened to us. Then as our lifestyles, appearances, and desires start to change, not by our words, but because God lives in us, others begin to realize that we are not the same person that we once were. As the scripture says, a tree is known by its fruit. It's communication with the Holy Spirit, where our very thought, desire, and intention is revealed to him, even before we know it. The Holy Spirit in us. From the time of his crucifixion until the judgment, he has taken control of everything. Nothing is hidden or accomplished that doesn't advance his kingdom of God. Hi! Welcome again to the Well, that was our teaching. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time. Now I live in all your promises, and nothing seems 
worthwhile Except to be In your kingdom of love My 